Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome back to another edition of the b &H Virtual Event Space. We're back for the final installment, part five of five of the Capture One series. We're talking advanced portrait editing in Capture One. Welcoming back to the event space, Maria Perez Cejuela Lopez. Maria, how are you? I'm perfect, and you're also perfect at pronouncing my name by now. I, at, at this point, if I if I didn't get it at least <laughs> close, then then just get rid of me. <laughs> we'll get rid of me. We'll get somebody else in this place. And ah, uh, no, never. We can have never. <laughs> awesome. Well, I know that everybody's been looking forward to this. I know in the green room we were talking about this, and I know that you know you are super excited to kind of dive into some of the editing features, which is the fun part of this. So hopefully everybody at home is super excited about it as well. Uh, just a reminder to everybody, if you are new to the event space, welcome. We're glad you're here. If you have any questions and you're joining us on Vimeo or Facebook, you can use the comment section to ask any questions. If you're joining us here on Zoom, use the Q&A tab. But otherwise, I'm going to let Maria jump into it right away. And I'm going to disappear for a little bit. But thanks for being here, Maria. And thanks to Capture One for sponsoring this event. Thanks, Scott. We are very excited to be giving this webinar today about advanced portrait editing. Remember, this is the fifth part of a series uh, that is ending today, but we're already planning some nice things uh, for you for when you're back on from the holidays, which are hopefully going to be very fun. We're planning some stuff for when the time you're back around September, so keep posted. Um, so I'm going to share my screen now, and before we jump right into Capture One, I just wanted to let you know briefly what we're going to be discussing today. On the last session, we did talk about portrait editing. We did more like a basic editing session without so many layers, or without so some of the more complex tools in Capture One. So if you're new to Capture One, that might be a very good place to start. I think that uh, someone's going to be posting on the chat in Zoom right now, the different classes. So if you want to start by the basics or with workflow or with the basic portrait editing, you can just check out the recording from the previous classes. By the way, this class will also be recorded and you will be able to find it on the event space. Um, and yes, as Scott said, feel free to post any questions in the chat or in the Q&A tab. So this is what we're going to be talking about today. Um, I chose one portrait. I didn't want to make it too complicated. And I think that if we just focus on one photo and try to get the, the most out of it, it's going to be the simplest way to talk about all the tools that we can use in Capture One to enhance a portrait. In the end of the day, when we are shooting raw and we are editing raw files, um, this that I'm going, that I'm about to say might, might sound a little bit obvious, but it's important to think that we want the image to actually improve. We wanted to get far, far away with it. We wanted to get to a point and it's better than what we used to have in the raw. And the reason I mentioned this, despite it being obvious, is that sometimes we're just so caught into the process that we kind of forget where we are trying to take things. So I'm going to approach it from an aesthetic point of view as well as a technical point of view. So this is a script for what we wanted to talk about today. We're going to talk about how to make the skin corrections in Capture One, but further than just the technical way of how it works, the, the tools work, I wanted to reflect on tools that we can use to make the subject pop, uh, using composition and lights and colors, creating a mood uh, with tools like the film grain. Uh, and we will, we will also use the retouch tools built into Capture One, the healing and the cloning brush. And we will see also how we can do dodge and burning with the style brushes. So we have quite an ambitious agenda, so let's just get right into it. So this is Capture One now. This is the photo that I selected for us to work with today. So since I'm not going to be using some of the other photos, I'm just going to hide this um, browser here. So it's not bothering us. We can easily do that with our keyboard, Command B. And so we can focus right on what we want to, to do. Okay. So if you remember the last session, if you were there, I told you that I would like to follow a very specific um, order of steps to approach my editing. Um, the first thing I do is uh, work with the cropping, work with the composition, and then I will just move on to work with light and contrast and then color. And then we will move on to more local adjustments. So this is the way I like to do it. And it, 
I like it to do it this way because it helps me to look at the right things in the right moment and to have a workflow that will not only help me uh, by the logic of the tools but themselves, but also to organize myself with my own logic in, what, in the sense of what I want to do with the photo. So the first thing that I want to do here is to crop. So we can do that from different parts of the interface. Normally, I just typically choose the cropping tool from here, from the toolbar. Just going to click here, and then we can change the cropping around and crop the photo as we like it to be. Um, there is different tools that help us to crop. There is this guide that we can turn on and off this, this grid. If we want to change the grid, we can do it from the tool tab shape. Remember that this is a new interface in, in 15.3 that was released in July. So if you are seeing a different interface, this is because you're not in the latest version, but that's fine. You will find the more or less the same tool is in more or less the same order. So in here, I just wanted to mention about these grids. We can choose them to just uh, be shown when we are cropping, or we can choose them to be shown always. And there is different actually types of grids that we can use. Typically, I just set it on rectangular and I split it on three per three. But we can also use the golden ratio or even the Fibonacci spiral if that's what you want to use. I'm just going to keep it on rectangular, but I just briefly wanted to mention that this is a possibility and I typically just have it by default on follow crop. So that's always going to help me to um, work on my composition and my photos. So in this case, we have this kind of editorial portrait and there is a specific aspect ratio that I like to use for this kind of portraits, which is four per five. Um, the reason behind this, there is not like um, a very specific reason for it, but it kind of reminds me to, because four per five is uh, an aspect ratio that is very much used in magazines traditionally. So when it's something like editorial, I prefer to use this aspect ratio because I don't know, it just looks, it helps me to center more the subject and it kind of gives me this magazine vibe. So this is uh, the spec ratio that, that I will be using today. You can just click and hold the submenu drops and then you can choose whatever aspect ratio you want to work with or stay with the original one, up to you. In my case, four per five. And I'm just going to center the composition a little bit more around the subject. We don't need all of this air on top, so I'm going to keep it like that. When we have crop, we just need to press enter and that will be instantly applied. Remember in any case that this is a raw file editor. It means that all editing is non-destructive. So in the case that you went too far with your cropping or with any other kind of adjustments, you can always reset all of the settings from here, from this top left button. And that will always get you back to the raw file, including uh, the, the original composition. So just going to go back, Command Z, Control Z for Windows so I can stay with this nice cropping that I made. Okay, this is what I would like to do first. Uh, I'm not going to do any keystone for obvious reasons and I'm not going to do any rotation. I think the, the rotation is fine like that. And then I'm just going to right on jump into the um, lights and the uh, contrast. There is actually one thing that I wanted to show you. Uh, this is a Fujifilm file. Uh, you can't see it here. It's, this is a Capture One native format, but it's actually a raw file from Fuji, as you can see here from GFX 100. And the thing that I wanted to mention about uh, the Fuji files is that in case you didn't know, the Fujifilm film simulations are fully compatible with Capture One. So we can always come here to the curve next to the camera profiles and choose any simulation that we want to use as a basis. We have both the black and white and the color simulations. So we can pick this as a starting point for our editing. As you can see, there is tons of options. I really do love the Fuji files because of this, because some of these simulations, they are just so nice. Uh, and they have this such this, like this nice mood to it. And I really tend to start my editing from one of these when I'm um, editing Fuji files. So I just wanted to mention that in case you are Fuji users, uh, because this is available for you. And it's in this tool here, the base characteristics. In this case, I'm just going to stay with the standard uh, simulation because I think uh, I want to make this as generic as possible for all the camera users as well. And it's kind of cheating if I start from a nicer uh, point of view because of the Fuji simulations. So I'm just going to keep um, to stick to the standard for today. 
um, and then maybe another day we can do um, an editing with, with the specific Fuji profiles. Now, right onto the editing. So when I approach editing, as I said, I like to keep this very nice and tidy workflow. So the next thing that I would do is to work around with the light and the contrast, uh, just in a basic layer. We could just uh, jump right ahead to working in the background, but I'm not gonna do that. I'm going to start right on a different layer and I'm going to show you why. The layer that I'm going to use now, it's uh, the simplest one. You just go here into the layer panel in the adjust tool tab, layer panel. And on this plus, you just click and hold and you get these different layer options. I'm going to choose a new field adjustment layer. What that's meaning is that if I show the mask, uh, we can do that easily with the shortcut M on the keyboard. We can see that there is already a mask that covers all of the image. And that's exactly what I want because I'm just going to use this layer as my background. So I'm just going to treat it like my background for the basic adjustments. And the reason I'm doing that, uh, let's say, let's just take it like really, really far. Let's say I want a really contrasted image and then uh, as adjustments start, start to pile up, then we find that we went a little bit too far with this. Then we can just reduce the opacity from any of the layers at any given point. And this is why I like to start with a layer as a my background, because it gives me a lot of flexibility if then I need to pull back on the adjustments. So this is why I do it. On the background, we don't have this opacity control. And then it's kind of cumbersome when you just need to go into the background and search for the adjustments that you need to pull back on. If you are on the layer, just pull back on the whole opacity slider and you're good to go. So that's what I'm doing. So now let's start with exposure and adjustments. I'm just going to make it slightly brighter by pulling up the exposure just like two tenths of a stop. And what we want to do now is to work with the contrast. We have different ways to work with contrast. Um, if you pay attention to the last webinar, I like to use it to do it on the, on the curves panel, actually, instead of the contrast, because the contrast is nice, but it doesn't give you as much control. And I also feel that it makes the shadows too black and there is um, many more possibilities to lose detail when we work with the contrast lighter because we can't be as thorough with what we are doing. So instead, I'm just gonna show you how I use the curves. In this case, for this specific portrait, I'm going to use the Luma curve. The reason I use the Luma curve instead of the standard RGB is because the RGB curve affects saturation a lot. So if we make like an S-shaped curve, which is what I typically tend to do, we can see that the reds and the yellows are kind of starting to go crazy. And we don't want that. We want to keep naturals, uh, we want to keep colors natural. We want to keep a nice skin tone. So the RGB curve is not going to be our friend in this case. Instead, if I do it from the Luma curve, even if I apply a very abrupt curve like that one, that's going to also affect saturation, but it's going to affect it in a different way. It's going to slightly desaturate it, which is so much better than just saturating certain colors randomly. So if we apply the, set, the contrast from the Luma curve, then we can always recover the saturation that we lost in a natural and controlled way without going crazy on the red side of things. Even though this is too abrupt, so I'm just going to make it a little bit more natural. Just really wanted to show you the difference between the RGB and the Luma curve. The Luma curve is something like very genuine for Capture One. I don't think it exists in any other software and it just helps me so much to work with my contrast in portraits um, as opposed to the RGB curve. It just gives you so much more flexibility. Uh, without completely ruining the skin tone. Mm -hmm. So if you're not used to work in curves, I'm just going to explain very briefly what I'm doing here. I'm just drawing a point here I'm around this corner. You can see that there is a grid. So just take this point as reference. This is where the shadows lie. And I'm just going to pull it down just a little bit to make the shadows a little bit more dense. And then we have on the other side of the grid, this point up here, this represents the highlights roughly. So I'm just going to pull it a little bit up. So what that's going to create, it's this very subtle S. That means that the shadows are going down and the highlights are going up. And this is what's gonna give us this feeling of contrast. And the reason I like doing curves too is because 
if we work with these points like to the right or to the left, we can also have an effect on what we are doing to the midtones. In the case of a portrait, we don't want to take the midtones too deep because then we are going to be affecting texture a lot. And it might be the case when we are starting to highlight some defects on the skin that we don't want to do. Um, in any case, you can see some stuff here that we're going to be working later with the retouch tools built into Capture One. But let's just keep it around here. So we have nice contrast. Uh, we have some more volume, uh, but we have a very, a very balanced um, color and texture and contrast. Of course, this is only the beginning. Now I'm just going to open up the shadows just a little bit and we can just work with in this way just by controlling the shadow slider and the curve like so and find a balance that we like. So the more I pull it down, the, um, the darker I'm going to make the shadows and then I can just open it up from the high dynamic range tool if I feel I went a little bit too far. So I don't care if it's a little bit moody. I think it's it's kind of nice that it's that it has a nice contrast. On the highlight side of things, I think we're good. I don't really think we need to work with the highlights. And I'm going to recover part of this saturation that we lost when we use the Luma curve. Not too much though, because I don't want it to be a very saturated image. And this part, this orange part on the right can be very dominating and I don't want the skin tone to go too crazy and I'm going to work in that separately in another layer. So I think this is a good base. This is a good starting point for our edit. Maybe I'm just going to apply a little bit of clarity to the whole background, but just a little bit. Don't worry about the texture because then if, there, if there's something that went a little bit too wild, then we can just uh, recover it using another layer. So this is our base. Um, you remember what I said before about getting caught in the process. So to avoid being too caught in the process and realizing that you're completely ruining an image, what I recommend you to do, there is like no magic trick for that, but something that helps me is to keep looking at the before and after constantly. You can turn it on and off from the interface right here or easily with the letter Y on the keyboard. So you can also use this like split view. Personally, I prefer using the normal view and then just toggling on and off fast using the letter on the keyboard. And that allows me to see that we have nice color, we have nicer texture and contrast, and we ha also have detail everywhere. This is of course just the basis. And then we would move on to work with color. So the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm going to apply a generic color grading, and then we're going to work specifically on the skin. And we have quite a lot to do on the skin. Uh, you can see that there is a huge difference in the skin tone from the face to the hand. That is something completely natural and normal. Mm, this super uh, purple hand probably indicates that this guy was super cold at the session, uh, but hopefully we can fix that. So to do color, I'm just going to work with another layer. The reason I do that is because I like to keep separate my contrast and light adjustments and my color adjustments. And then if I need to play around with the opacity, I can just find a nice um, balance to it. So again, going into the layer panel and again, using a new field adjustment layer. This time I'm gonna call it color. I'm going to try to be tidy with my layers. The first thing I typically do with color is to work with the white balance. So I'm just going to warm it up just a little bit. That's probably too much. Something we can do is just to click here and do it with the um, arrows on the keyboard. So something like that. And I want it to be also kind of a little bit more green to have, because it, this photo has like this kind of vintage feeling. So I think that the green is gonna help us better than the magenta on this side of things. So that's the basis. And then we're just gonna apply a little color grading. We're going to use one of my favorite tools for that. It's called the color balance. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna apply some different color grading for the shadows and for the highlights. We're not gonna work with the mid-tones today. Something that works really nice, I um, explained fully in depth what this tool does at the previous session. So keep, take a look at it if you are interested to know more about it but I do need to work with um, the other tool today. So we have time for everything. So if you're curious to see how this tool works, 
just watch the other video. What I typically do is just choose a hue that I like for the shadows. Typically, I tend to gravitate more towards cooler tones. I think like this kind of cyan green, it's going to work nicely. This is, of course, too much. So I'm just going to put it down and then just gradually up until I find a feel that I like. So this shadow right here is going, is going to start looking a little bit green, which I really like. And then to compensate on the highlights, this is going to go towards the warmer side of things. And I think that has a really nice vibe to it. So this is the before this specific layer, and this is the after. And I really like to use this tool for color grading because it allows me to just create a mood for the image and to invent a story behind the image the way I like it to be. Maybe the skin tone is not super perfect and natural, but if you think about it, we just see this kind of color grading in movies all the time and it doesn't need to be realistic. It just needs to tell a story. And this is what I'm going for with this editing, just telling a story, uh, going for this vintage look. So that's what I'm going to be pursuing. Of course, we still need to take care of the skin tone correction. And for that, I'm going to still use a different layer. Well, before that, I'm going to, I think, um, yes, I'm going to unify the skin tone in the face uh, with using the same layer because we, get, we can reuse it and then we don't need to have uh, such a mess with layers. But then we probably need to work with another layer for this specific zone because it's just like too out of range. So before going for the other layer, I'm going to use the color editor, the skin tone color editor that we also explained in the previous session in depth. So I'm just going to explain it again today briefly. In the color editor, we have these different modules. Today, we're going to work, as I said, with the skin tone. I know that this tool is not super intuitive at first because it's like everything straight out and there is nothing here, but don't panic because it's really easy to use. We just need to take this dropper and we need to select, actually I'm gonna zoom in 100% to make sure I select a very nice sample. We just take the dropper and we select a sample from the skin. And I'm going to select a part that is neutral. I'm not going to select a part that is a uh, highlight. I'm not going to select the shadows. I'm just going to select like maybe here in the cheek. Yeah, and that's going to represent the color selection right on this color wheel. And then we just need to make sure that we are applying the corrections to the right color range, because you can see that this part of the uh, image, for example, it's also being affected uh, and we don't want that. So we can just toggle on the view selected color range and just work with this color selection and refine it until we just get there, whatever we want to get in there. Yeah, somewhere around there where we can keep the skin tone and we don't need to work as much with the other parts of the image. And now we can work with the hue and the saturation and the brightness, specifically for the skin tone. So if I go all the way to the right, you're gonna see that the skin tone gets like a grayish tone. And on the left, it's going to go more for a magenta tone. Actually, this is still being affected, which kind of bothers me. So I'm going to use another layer after all, just to make sure that I'm not affecting this part of the image and that I'm just selecting the things right. So in this case, I'm going to create an empty layer. So I'm going to create an empty layer. And the mask that I'm going to do, it's just like ridiculously easy to create. We don't need to make a very specific mask for what we want to do because we're going to combine it with this color selection that I was going for. So what I'm going to do is just grab this uh, gradient gradient mask. Just going to take the mask and I'm going to draw a gradient. And I'm going to just adjust it so I cover the face and also partially the hand. Of course, we need to invert the selection. We can do that by right clicking and invert mask. We're gonna call it skin. And in here, we can just work with the refining of the mask, with the size of the mask and the position. Don't worry if the hand's not all there because we're going to work in, on the hand in a separate layer anyways. So for now, we are good. And right now, 
because only the mask will be affected. We can just work with a skin tone selection and it doesn't matter that all the parts are inside the mask because it will just not have an effect on them. So again, picking my sample and now I can really work with parts of the skin that I really wanna work with. I'm going to try to keep the lips out of the selection just to make sure I'm really focusing here on the skin. There you go. And now to zoom in on the face. And now, as I wanted to say before, we can work separately with the hue and the saturation and the brightness, but in a very controlled and nice way. So even if we go all the way to the right or to the left, the effect that it has, it's still kind of subtle. It's not completely changing the color of the skin. I'm going to go more for a kind of a greenish, desaturated skin for this kind of mood that I'm trying to achieve. Something around there. <coughs> Excuse me. And then on the uniformity slider, if I take it all the way to the right, you can see that the whole skin tone comes uh, together. But in this case, it's too much. So I'm just going to try to do something a little bit more natural. Also with the saturation, it can help us to get rid of some uh, blemishes that we have on the skin. But if we take it too far, it will start looking kind of unnatural. So I think I'm going to go for a balance like around there. And let's see the before and after. This is the before. This is the after. And I think it just, it's not a big difference. It's a subtle difference. But this is what makes like a good editing in the end of the day. Like uh, the sum of a lot of subtleties is called, called, what's going to define our image in the end. So going back to the whole thing, let's just keep seeing the before and after. Before and after, you can see that we've come a long way just with these settings and we're still going to take it a little bit further. Now let's start with the fun of unifying the skin tone in the hand to the skin tone on the face. So even if uh, this was partially covered by our mask, as I said before, this skin tone is, too, is way too out of range. Um, so we need to work on that in an independent layer. So again, I'm going to use the same resource. I'm going to work with a new empty layer. It means there is no mask. We're just going to create the radial gradient mask just as we did with the skin. And we're going to work on a color selection over that mask. So empty adjustment layer, just going to call it hand. And again, using our radial gradient right here to define what we want to be affected. So I press M on my keyboard to make sure I'm seeing the mask and then right click and invert. I'm going to make a very smooth mask and I'm going to position it in a way that it will cover the whole hand, just like so. Again, it doesn't matter if it's coming out of the hand because we're just going to combine this with a color selection. This is one of my favorite things at Capture One, actually, that you don't need to be very thorough uh, doing masks because you can just be lazy. And sometimes lazy is good because we don't need to spend a lot of time like brushing in and getting the perfect mask for this hand. We just don't need to do that. So that's time we save. So now that we have it like that, I'm just going to, um, again, use this dropper and I'm going to select the skin tone again. Let's see how this works. It might be that we need to also work from the basic or the advanced color editor, but we're going to try to keep everything within the skin tone one. So note that I selected the selection on the face again, not on the hand itself, because this is the skin tone that we want to unify it with. We don't want to unify the hand with the skin tone of the hand. We want to unify it with the one on the face. And it's this first selection that's going to be the reference point to which Capture One will try to pull all the other tones. So first of all, I really need to take this to the right side of things. And I'm going to try to work on the hue and the saturation. You see how that's already looking so much better. We just need to maybe saturate it just a little bit more. And see with just that adjustment, it's gone such a long way. 
I think actually I'm going to leave it like that. Maybe I'm just going to pull down the brightness just a little bit because we also don't want the hand to get too much attention. And I think that's pretty much it. I mean, you can see like why I love this tool and why I work. I love this way to work with layers and with color selections all together. It's because it just makes it so much easier to work with the skin tone. You don't need to brush in here. You don't need to do super weird and complicated color adjustments. Just use the skin tone one. Uh, make sure that you're in a mouse with a color selection and you're good to go. So keep looking on the global before and after. We came from here to here, which is very nice. We created a mood. We corrected the skin tone. We have nice contrast. We have nice colors. And let's see then what we can do to take this a little bit further. So I like to work um, in editing as a funnel, starting with the most generic things. Like remember cropping and then light, contrast, color, and then now skin tone. And then I'm going to be going down on this funnel um, towards more local and specific adjustments. So let's do that. Um, there is a couple of things that we can do at this point. I think that the first thing I'm gonna do is to show you how to work with the style brushes. Style brushes are rather new. They started last year and they became quickly one of my favorite tools in Capture One because they allow you to brush in adjustments but again, not with complicated masks that you have to be very thorough with, but with very intuitive masks. Also these style brushes, they work as a charm with a Wacom tablet when you have this kind of pen. And then you can just act as if you were basically painting or drawing. And I have a background on that, but you don't need that. And um, just work around with the brushes in a very intuitive way and brush in whatever you need to. So for example, in the built-in style brushes, I'm just going to use the brushes that come in by default so we can all achieve the same thing at home. And I'm going to go over here to the enhancements. We have different enhancements that we can use like Add Detail, Deep Sky for portraits. We have a nice one that is called Iris Enhance and that's what we're gonna use. I'm going to zoom in to the eyes and the, the way to work with this is just let's take the brush. Then that's also automatically going to select the brush tool and then we just need to really brush it in. You can see that another layer is automatically being created with the same name as a brush to keep things nice and tidy. And then we just need to keep brushing the adjustment until we are happy with them. So this is the before of the layer and this is the after of the layer. Let's just see it in the whole. I think that's a nice balance point because it's just helping us to direct the viewer's look towards the look towards the eyes but without making it too obvious. What would happen if we went a little bit too far with these adjustments? Let's say that I'm just like, like really, really close. And then I don't have the rest of the image as a context. So then I just go back and I say like, whoa, it's a little bit too weird. It's, he kind of looks like a robot. So we don't want that. That's not a problem. We can always toggle down the opacity and stay at any point in the middle, let's say around 40%. I think that's going to be a nice touch without making it too obvious, maybe just a little bit more around 50%. Okay, that's one of the fine adjustments that we can do thanks to the style brushes. There is also a red skin reduction. So in the case that we had, I don't think it's the case here, let's take a closer look. Actually, this part of the face a little bit more red than the other, but I, it doesn't really bother me. If we had, in the case that we had a lot of red skin, we could use the skin red, this, the red skin reduction very easily. Maybe I'm just going to use it on the eyes, just on this part. See how that works. You can see that we have different effects like the white and teeth one. Um, and the good thing about this is this is a raw file. So remember, you can always go back to what you used to have. This is not like uh, the brushes in Photoshop where you need to be very thorough of what you're doing and very mindful of the order of the adjustments. In this case, it doesn't matter. The order of the layers doesn't matter because it's not going to affect the final look of the image. This is why working with layers in Capture One, it's more intuitive than working in Photoshop. We don't have as much flexibility, but on the other hand, it's simpler. So I'm taking the red skin reduction. 
and just going to brush it in here, see if that helps us in any way. Maybe also a little bit below the eye, just working by changing my sizes around. And again, that's a subtle effect. It's not a huge effect, but I think it does some good to the image. So this is the before and this is the after. Again, it's about the little details that make an editing good. So I'm a little good here, I think. And the next thing I'm going to do with the brushes uh, is the dodge and burning. This, this is also a very nice workflow to do dodge and burning with the brushes because you just need to take, well, the dodge and burn brushes that are right here pre-built and just work around with those. Typically, I start with the burning and I don't do anything too crazy. I just try to look how the shadows and the lights are naturally fallen, falling from the lighting that was used in the picture. And I'm just trying to enhance that. So going to zoom in a little bit, not too much because I also like to keep like the context. Okay, yeah, there you go. So on this case with the skin, the burning that I'm going to be doing is just enhancing the shadows that naturally come in here. So by default, these brushes, they come with a very low flow. It means that you're brushing in the adjustments ever so slightly. So you need to insist on the same zone if you want the adjustment to be more visible. So I'm just brushing it right now. And if I press M here, you can see that a very, very soft and subtle mask is being created. And this is what's giving us the effect. So maybe a little bit bigger, just like brushing in here, I'm going to try to enhance this very subtle shadow from the cheekbone to get like a little bit more of a dramatic effect. We can also use it on the beard and the mustache. Just have the feeling of a like very dense beard, a very like a beard that you care about, you know? I mean, I don't know much about beards, obviously, but you know, like a nice beard. So around there, then we can also enhance this little shadow here. We are obviously not going to enhance the shadows beneath the eyes. We're going to try to do the exact opposite with the dodging part. We'll just get right there. So this we can do. And I actually really like this shadow that is being projected from the window and it's creating this kind of mysterious line on the face. So I'm going to try to enhance that actually. I'm going to make a bigger brush. I'm just gonna make a couple of brush strokes like that, just to enhance this shadow. It's kind of taking like weird tint, so I'm just going to warm it up just a little bit from the white balance. And this adjustment is just going to affect, of course, whatever is in my mask. So let's see what we are doing before the layer, after the layer. I might have come a little bit too far, but doesn't matter, we can just toggle down the opacity. Another thing we can do, thanks to the dodge and burning, is to use the light and the shadows to direct the look of the viewer. So for example, I still think that there is a little bit too much light on this hand that it's taking a little bit too much attention and it's out of focus anyways. So we don't want that. So I'm just going to make a couple of brush strokes here. And also we can create like a funny vignetting instead of just having like a very circular vignette that looks like kind of a lens effect. We can have our own vignette just by going around the image and just darkening some parts of the image that we want to be darker. Maybe we can even like enhance this shadow again. And you can see if I press M now, the mask that we are creating, it's just a very wild mask really. It's, it doesn't have a logic to it besides what we want it to be. And that's creating a very subtle mask that is going to help us to gain a little bit more contrast in the image in a controlled way. So before and after, I think I went a little bit too far. So just pushing it down to 80% maybe capacity, that's looking better. And now the way to, actually, I'm just going to 
like there. Okay. And now we have the burning, and of course, we need the dodging. They need to go together because we need to maintain a balance between the light and the shadows. So if we did the burning, we typically need to do the dodging. So let's just grab the dodging brush in this case, that's going to create a different layer automatically. So we don't need to worry about that. Again, let's start from the face and then we'll move on to the rest of the image. So something that I wanna dodge a little bit, it's the eyes, just a little bit because we already work on those, if you remember, but just a little bit of an extra touch of brightness there. And then we're just going to work in the same way as we did before, just like lighting up the parts of the face that are already kind of naturally lit. So we can give some brightness over here, here on the nose, that's too much. Just here, creating some nice contrast here on the, just on the gloss of the lips, not on the whole thing. That's going to create volume, maybe just here and, this is a really nice thing that I like to do with a dodging brush, which is just to correct these shadows on the eyes. Um, some people like to do this with cloning uh, or like healing. I typically prefer to do it with lights because it does respect the texture. Um, and it means that the skin texture that is naturally there is going to be respected. And the only thing that is actually created this this feel like tired eyes is actually the way that on the way that light and shadow is falling. So if we fix that little shadow, it's going to have a very nice effect. We're going to see. So making it smaller, I'm going to get closer on this part. And I'm just going to fix. This is kind of a more chirurgical way. Chirurgical, surgical. Okay, I don't know. You, I hope you understand. English is obviously not my native language, but I hope that, yeah, it's, it's just like, I meant it's like a more precise adjustment that we need to do here. And we're just going to try to bring back some light on this part of the eyes. And just this little wrinkle here. Okay, so let's see before and after. This is the now. And this is the before. You can see that it has a huge effect. If we go all the way back, this is this guy looks tired. This guy looks more fresh. He looks like he had a good night's sleep, which is what we probably want. So the same goes again with the other eye. The other eye, we can't light it so much because it's falling on the shadow. If we light it too much, it's going to be weird, but we can still try to enhance specifically this part over here. We need to be careful that we are not completely deleting this shadow because if we do, then that's going to affect the way we perceive the volume of the face. And then that's, it's going to look like, it's going to look like a different face uh, and we don't want that. So something like around there just not removing it completely, but just kind of giving it some freshness. So this is before and after again, this is before, this is after. And then again, I'm just going to randomly paint around some lights on the rest of the image just to get, well, a little bit more of an interesting effect. So more light here on the window that is going to have a nice contrast with the shadow. Maybe over here, we can just have a little bit more light because this is a, one of the light sources of the image. So it's good that we have some extra light over here. So this is, I'm going to show you now without a dodge and burning. So this is without a dodge and burning. And this is with dodge and burning. As you can see, it is so much more volumetric and it has this nice feel to it. So this is it about the style brushes. And we are just about to wrap our, our session. And the last thing I typically do is to work with the healing brushes if we need that we have two tools for that we have the healing and the cloning for portraits we will typically use more the healing part i actually don't know if i'm going to use the cloning here probably not i would use the cloning ever so slightly maybe for this shadows under the eyes but in this case i did with the um, dodging br brush and i'm happy about that so i'm not going to be using that one anymore 
So what is left to correct here is this little well defect on the skin, these little blemishes. We're going to try to fix those with a healing brush. So we just take the brush here. Capture One will also automatically create the layer in this case as well. So just taking the healing brush and let's just see what we can do with it. Um, by default, Capture One will select a point to heal from, so like a source point, if we don't choose one by ourselves. So I'm just going to start with the proposed one and see what we get. So for example, this one here. So it's thinking, it's just like streaming and doing this all together. It's a little bit too much for my computer right now, but it's working. Okay, it picked this source point. We can of course choose if we want to display or hide the arrows. I'm going to hide them now. And actually I want a very low hardness and a big opacity. So in this case, it worked well. Actually, we need it to be a little bit bigger. So I'm just going to redo that with a bigger brush. And let's see what happens now. So now it did a better job. We need to make sure actually <coughs> that the brush is covering the whole surface that we want to heal. So in this case, let's just try a bigger thing like this one here. Let's see what Capture One chooses. And I'm going to actually toggle down the mask feature. So we don't need to see the mask all the time. Yeah, so we can see that it selected a source point that is not so flattering right now. So I'm going to go back on that. And then I'm going to choose my own brushing point. So we need to make sure that we select a part with a texture that is similar to what we want to do. So in this case, this one, and we have enough space around it to heal. So I just chose it myself. And now Capture One is just adapting the light and the color. And I think in this case, it works better. And I'm going to keep doing that. And I'm going to keep selecting the right healing points. Just takes a little bit more to think. So this is the before and after, this is before, this is after. There is like some kind of spots generating. So we need to be mindful of that. And we need to make sure that we are not generating any weird textures. So I think that's looking better now in here because it's part of the beard. I think the safest bet is just to go for another hair randomly put here. So that's just going to select that and put it here. And I think it did a really good job at that. Make sure that you are selecting the right source point. This is the most important with this tool. Oops, I didn't want to do that. Going back. The most important with this tool is just to select the right source point. So select the right source point. You just need to click and hold the Alt key. And then you're going to get uh, a cursor that looks like this little cross. And then you can just select whatever point and just apply it wherever you need it. So in this case, I'm going to get rid of that. That's looking good. I'm going to get rid of this little red spot here. You can do as many healings per layer as you want to. And you can be as thorough as you need to. So I think this is all good here. I don't, I don't, I'm not bothered by the freckles actually. I kind of like them. I like this one, for example, too. This one can go away probably. This one I'm going to remove as well. And yeah, basically it just goes on and on and on and until you are removed everything that you want to remove. That could be better. So I'm just going to retry it with a bigger brush again. So that's better now. And let's just see what we can do here on the forehead. This can be a little bit tricky because there's a lot of texture. It's just recalculating everything. That's not great. So let's just try to be a little bit more thorough here. I'm not going to remove the wrinkles. I think the wrinkles add on to the expression anyway. So I kind of like those. So I'm just going to make sure I remove the little spots. And yeah, it's just a matter of light and texture. So if you select the right texture, then Capture One will just probably adjust the lighting by itself as it needs to be. That's good, that's better. And then just being careful here to not affect 
the parts that we don't want to affect and on and on it goes and probably I'm just going to end with this little part here in the eye just going to select a part that a line or of a line that it that matches the actual lining let's see if we can do that yes we did that and it looks good and I think it's so much better now I mean let's see we could of course do it in a much more thorough way but I don't want to run out of time just by you watching me healing everything but I think it did quite a nice job so let's go back again this is the whole edit now I think that we can call it a day and again the before and after to end up with we just come from this point and let's see again the whole process just a little reminder we started with the basic adjustments with the luma curve and the shadow and the saturation then we did the color grading here maybe i'm just going to yeah that's going to be fun let's just toggle off all the layers and start to turn them on from the beginning so this is the raw then we did the luma and the contrast and the saturation then we did the color grading you know that that is the one that the team named like the nice punch then we fix the skin tone we fix the skin tone of the hand specifically we did the iris and hands we did the red skin correction around the eyes we did the burning we did the dodging and we healed the skin and this is where we are now i hope you like the editing and i hope you enjoyed the process and just let me know if you have any questions now excellent i gotta i gotta tell you i, I was a little hesitant after watching all of this to turn my camera back on. <laughs> I was nervous you were gonna start, you know, healing and removing things from my face. <laughs> it's all a lie in the end of the day. That's that's it. Now, 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 you know, I, I think I think in the industry, you get so used to seeing the retouching of, of females that uh, seeing it on a male person. Now you, you start to kind of understand that that mindset and you're like, oh, Oh, this is this is this is bad. <laughs> no, but that's I mean, fine. I, this is also why I picked the male portrait because it's something that we're not so used to see. And of course, it's also important to know how to treat the male skin. It's a little bit of a different process, but uh, in the end of the day, it's the same. It's about light and texture and respecting the structure of the face. Definitely. And I, and I think it was a great example and I think it was a great job. One thing I did want to hit on and I did want to ask you about, we discussed it a little bit last time. I kind of, I kind of introed with it. Um, I know that capture one just released, uh, the software for the iPad. Yes. Uh, maybe you can talk a little bit about that. I know that there's definitely tons of people who are out there using iPads, editing on iPads, you know, the iPad pro stuff like that, you know, can you give us a little insight into what the app looks like in terms of that? Is it, you know, full featured everything you see in the regular for PC or Mac? Um, is there any limitations? What does that look like? It's not yet with the full features because it's just the first version we released, but certainly some very interesting, nice things are already on the making. So what we can find right now on the iPad is all the basic features, but we don't have the layers just yet. We have the styles, we have the basic editing features, and we don't have the layers yet. That's already on the making, as I said, and I'm really looking forward personally to try them with the iPad pen because I think that it's just going to be so good. I think it's going to be such a nice experience. And I really trust the team that is building the app to make uh, the most out of the iPad features. So I think that's going to be great when we can, we, when we get to the point in the app when we can make all of these layers and just to pile, to pile up these uh, style brushes with the pen on the iPad, I think that's going to be great. That's still happening. And also something that we are working on is tethering. Tethering is not yet available on the iPad, but it's going to be probably by the end of this year, I would say. Awesome, awesome. And one, one thing I did want to highlight as well, um, I've used Capture One in the past, and um, one thing that I personally love about it is I love that when you scroll over some of the tools, you actually have something. If if you're like me, who forgets every single tool and what it does or anything like that, it's it's got a little link that'll pop up, and it'll take you kind of get a little tutorial that you can just kind of click on, and it can walk you through what what it actually does, which I think is a great feature, um, at least for people like me who just can't can't seem to remember anything <laughs> yeah that's fine we did it like that and we made it by default so we, 
<laughs> we just make it to help people who are getting started. And yeah, you can just hover and you get this watch tutorial and learn more thing. And also wanted to remind you that there is this learn button right on the interface. So you can click here and get some basic nice tools. You have to accept the cookies and sell your soul and all of that kind of thing. <laughs> but then you get all of these tutorials within the interface, which is very nice. Um, what we were talking about today is kind of more advanced features. So don't be intimidated by it. If you like what we did here and you want to learn it, there is tons of tutorials online. Just take it one step at a time. And we actually say this thing in Capture One, like internally for the way we work and the way we, we organize work, which is crawl, walk, run. And I think it just applies exactly the same to learning Capture One itself. Awesome. I, 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 I'm, I'm a fan of the lie, cheat, steal. No, <laughs> just kidding. Don't do that. Um, I, I, I want to thank you, Maria. Um, the whole series has been amazing. And uh, for those of you who didn't have a chance to watch them all, uh, we did drop the links in the chat here on Zoom and then on Vimeo and Facebook. They should be dropped in the comments section as well. So it'll give you the whole entire catalog of all the four previous events. Um, and then again, you know, if you want to watch part five, which is this part, you can just rewatch it by visiting vimeo.com slash bh event space and looking for the event You type in capture one. Um, but I also want to thank capture one as well for sponsoring the event because without them being here and allowing Maria to be here, then, uh, then you just you're left with me and I know nobody wants that. So, <laughs> so thank you very much, Maria. Thank you to you as well. I hope this was beneficial to everybody. I know I took a lot away from it. Um, that's all the time we have left in this series. But like Maria said, we are working to have her back here and see what we can plan next. So if you have any suggestions, if there's stuff that you want to see that maybe we didn't address this time, uh, you know, feel free to contact us on those social you know, websites. We're, we're more than happy to listen and bring back ideas to Maria and have discussions like that. That's obviously what we're doing here is trying to help all of our viewers out. So please let us know that's, uh, that's definitely our goal. Uh, but that's all the time we have for today. This has been another edition of the B&H Virtual Event Space. We'll catch you next time.